Good morning, everybody. Um, very good to be with you again. So last week, then, we began uh, looking, considering the um, passion of Christ, and we followed Jesus uh, as he entered Jerusalem here in this uh, panel. Uh, we saw him washing the feet of the disciples at the Last Supper. We saw him announcing the, the betrayal, the forthcoming betrayal uh, by Judas. Uh, we also saw him uh, speaking to his disciples, giving them his last words. And while that was going on, we saw that Judas was accepting the bribe uh, from the uh, chief priests and the leaders of the people. We then went with Jesus and the disciples into the Garden of Gethsemane. We didn't stay long there ourselves, uh, but we're going to do that uh, today. When supper was ended, we know that Jesus and the disciples sang some psalms and then left for the Garden of Olives. And Matthew tells us that they went to a small estate called Gethsemane. I imagine it as a, a small garden, a park, um, with perhaps uh, olive groves uh, in it. He said to his disciples, I'm reading from Matthew, stay here while I go over there to pray. He took Peter and the sons of Zebedee, we know that they are James and John, with him. And sadness came over him and great distress he said to them, my soul is sorrowful to the point of death. I could die of sorrow. Wait here and keep awake with me. And then going on a little further, he fell on his face and prayed, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass me by. Nevertheless, let it be as you, not I, would have it. Now, we remember that Jesus knew in advance exactly what was going to happen to him and all that was going to happen to him. So I imagine that all those things were in his prayer. And certainly knowing what was going to happen to him must have been an absolutely terrible uh, prospect uh, for him. We all know the terror uh, of something that we know is going to be unpleasant. Imagine it then uh, for Jesus. So this is how Duccio uh, shows it to us. He has taken the uh, 11 disciples remaining, the 11 apostles, and he has taken out of them Peter, dressed here as we have seen him before, in the green and with his distinctive hairstyle, James here in blue, and the young man, we saw that John is always represented uh, without a beard and as a young man. So those are the three, and Jesus is saying to them, stay here, I'm going to go over there to pray. And he just goes a stone's throw away from them, and there he is, and there is anguish on his face there. And this is the angel uh, to whom, well, he wasn't addressing himself to an angel, but uh, Duccio makes, uh, shows us the uh, a person, as it were, uh, to be the focus of uh, Christ's prayer, of Jesus' prayer. Sometimes artists will show 
uh, an angel with a, a chalice uh, in their hand, and that corresponds to the words that Jesus used, let this chalice or let this cup of sorrows and suffering pass me by. And then Matthew says, he came back to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, so you had not the strength to stay awake one hour with me. You should be awake and praying not to be put to the test. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Remember how Peter had said, though I, even if I should have to die for you, I'd never, I would never deny you, I would never betray you. I'll be with you all the time, don't you worry, you know, you could depend upon me. And here he is now, he can't stay awake even one hour. But we're all like that. I think, I think of myself, um, when my very dear brother was dying, and uh, I, I was with him uh, during the night, but I couldn't stay awake. I don't know how many times I practically fell off the chair uh, as, I, as I watched with him. It's not that I wanted to fall asleep, but I, I couldn't stay awake. So we're all, at least I certainly, I'm a bit like Peter. I want to be there, I want to be strong, but the flesh is, is weak. So Jesus says, stay awake, stay awake uh, morally, I suppose, and intentionally. We come back to that word that we saw last week uh, that Luke had used. He went resolutely to uh, Jerusalem. And that's what we have to be resolute uh, as we follow Jesus. So then a second time he went away and prayed. Father, he said, if this cup cannot pass by without my drinking it, your will be done. And he came back again and found them sleeping. Their eyes were so heavy. Leaving them there, he went away again and prayed for the third time, repeating the same words. Then he came back to his disciples and said to them, you can sleep on now. Take your rest. Now the hour has come when the Son of Man is to be betrayed into the hands of sinners. So, three times the same prayer. Here we have a detail of, of Jesus uh, with the angel up there. We can see the expression of anguish on his face. And in the next slide, just to remind her of him, we can imagine him. Perhaps this is one of the occasions coming back up there, saying, oh, we were very tired and our eyes were, were sleepy and, and so on. All right, now, uh, in the next slide, uh, we see what happens next. Um, he was still speaking. He was still saying those words to him. The Son of Man is to be betrayed into the hands of sinners. Matthew says, when Judas, one of the twelve, appeared, and with him a large number of men armed with swords and clubs. So this is how Jude, how Ducho shows it to us. This is Jesus, we have seen him. Um, and here is a whole crowd of people. We can see the helmets of the soldiers. We can see their swords. We can see the torches uh, that they needed to bring, the lamps that they brought. You can see them there, another torch here. And they're armed with swords and clubs. And Judas goes up to him. Judas goes up to Jesus and goes to kiss him, because that was the sign that he had given. And Luke says, Judas said, Jesus said, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? Then, says Matthew, all the disciples deserted him and ran away. Now, 
here's the big crowd around him. Look at what's happening over here. They can't get out of the scene fast enough. You can see how Duccio has made them all leaning over in this direction as they run out. And another very clever thing, this is the crowd around Jesus now. Look at the space, look at the gap they have left. They have separated themselves from Jesus. The crowd now around Jesus is no longer the crowd of disciples, no longer the 12 apostles, but soldiers uh, armed with clubs and swords. Another little detail uh, that uh, occurred during that uh, event was that Peter, who had a knife, um, cut off the ear of the priest, the high priest's servant, his name was Malchus. Uh, and then if you remember, Jesus told him to, uh, in some of the accounts it's his sword, but in another it's his knife. And Jesus says, put your sword back into its scabbard. And he touched the man's ear, and the man's ear was, he uh, was healed. Uh, I have a detail uh, of that uh, just here. <laughs> Peter again, fierce, and there's the knife, look at the ear falling down ever it has been uh, cut off. Um, and then in the next uh, slide we see uh, a detail of Judas going up to Jesus. Look at Jesus' hand there, it's as if he was uh, pushing, uh, pushing Judas away. Uh, he knows exactly what Judas is doing, but uh, Jesus is not... Uh, you know, responding to this, to this uh, false uh, kiss, he knows exactly uh, what it's about. Having been arrested, as we can see in that uh, detail there, Jesus is subjected to what you can only call a phony trial. Um, he's tried by both the religious leaders and the civil leaders, the civil authorities. He's going to be interrogated, questioned, five times by four different people. Two of those people are religious leaders and two of the, those are uh, representatives of the civil authorities. So, uh, let's just think about that for a moment. Um, the civil authorities, that's the, that is, we have to remember that Palestine, that whole area of what we call the Holy Land, um, in the time of Jesus was a Roman colony. It had been invaded by the Romans and the Romans had taken over. It was a Roman colony and they had put Roman tax collectors in there to collect money, take the money from the people to fill the coffers of the people in Rome. And the tax collectors were very much hated, of course they were. And so were the, uh, the uh, representatives of the Roman authorities. The religious authorities are the Jewish people, the Jewish leaders, and remember that Jesus was a Jew himself, so his own people, the representatives of his own people, are the religious authorities. So now we'll see the uh, first uh, of these interrogations. And we're told, Matthew says, they took him first to Annas, because Annas was the father-in-law of Caiaphas who was high priest that year. So let's think a little bit for a moment about Annas. This is Annas here, uh, sitting in this very uh, grand looking uh, chair. And here is Jesus, he's got his hands tied together. Uh, and here are the soldiers again with their helmets um, uh, uh, accusing him uh, all around him. So who was Annas? He wasn't just the father-in-law of Caiaphas. Annas was a very influential figure in Jewish society at the time of Jesus. He himself had been 
high priest for about eight or nine years, uh, from the year 6 AD to the year 15 AD. In other words, the years in which Jesus was growing up. If we take 1 AD as the year, let's say, that uh, Jesus was born, I know there are arguments about it, whether it was exactly that, or minus 1 or minus 2, but let's take it as 1 AD. Uh, he was growing up between six, uh, the year 6 and the year 15. Um, Annas had five sons, and in Jewish society he considered that was a, considered a very great blessing. And those five sons had each succeeded him as high priest. Before then, his son-in-law, Caiaphas, was appointed in his turn high priest in about the year 18 AD. He was a member of the Sanhedrin, that uh, corporation or council body of authorities. And he was also the most prominent member of a wealthy aristocratic faction in Jewish society which collaborated with Roman rule. But that's who Annas was, a very influential, powerful figure, and we can guess uh, how he was regarded by the people. Now, Annas questioned Jesus, we are told, about his disciples and his teaching. He's a religious leader. The questions he asks them are about re uh, the religious, about a, a right, uh, uh, about the liturgy, shall we say, his disciples. Who are your disciples and what are you teaching? Jesus answered, I'm reading from John. I have spoken openly for all the world to hear. I have always taught in the synagogue and the temple where all the Jews meet together. I have said nothing in secret. But why ask me? Ask my hearers what I taught. They know what I said. At these words, one of the guards standing by gave Jesus a slap in the face. Look at him here, right, raising his arm there in his hand to give Jesus a blow in the face, saying, Is that the way to answer the high priest? Jesus replied, If there's something wrong in what I said, point it out. But if there's no offence in it, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him, still bound, to Caiaphas, the high priest. So that's what's happening in this first uh, interview. Now, he has been brought up the stairs into a, an upper room. Here's the door, one door leading into it. And um, Annas has shown us an elderly man there a long, very full, grey beard, his head covered there with that white uh, cloth. Now, look at this little detail here uh, on the lower right-hand corner. That's the top of the stairs, uh, which will uh, lead us down. Look, can you see that? Lead us down into the courtyard below. Because there's another narrative going on in the gospel, uh, in the account of the Passion at the same time. And that's the narrative of Peter denying Christ three times. So this is the first uh, of the denials. We see a courtyard, we see that a fire has been lit in the courtyard, we see these people very realistically, look, warming their hands in a very characteristic pose there in front of a fire. And Peter, look at Peter's feet. Can you see his feet turned up? <laughs> he's got his sandals, he has taken off his sandals 
and is warming his feet at the fire. Now there's a concentration on feet, and um, if you remember back to last week, one of the, the important things that Jesus did at the Last Supper was he washed the feet, isn't that right? of his disciples. And that's only, let's say, a few minutes ago uh, during the Last Supper, well, an hour ago, anyhow, uh, during the Last Supper. So we, we think uh, about those feet, Peter's feet. Not my feet, Lord, but my head and my hands, the whole lot. No. If I don't wash your feet, you can't have anything to do with me, and it's only sufficient that I wash your feet. Let me just read the text uh, from Luke. They had lit a fire in the middle of the courtyard, and Peter sat down among them. And as he was sitting there by the blaze, a servant girl saw him, peered at him, and said, this person was with him too. But he denied it. Woman, he said, I do not know him. That's the first time. Now, uh, he will do the same thing a second time. Uh, first of all, before we move on from Annas, just to see how Duccio has linked those two uh, scenes of the Passion. We have looked at them separately, but they are, as you can see, uh, one, uh, one composition there in the, uh, in the painting. So they bring him along then to Caiaphas. This is the second time now, and the second person who's going to interrogate him. In this painting, notice Caiaphas, again dressed as a high priest, he's tearing his garments. Uh, if you heard a blasphemy, uh, in order to uh, distance yourself from it, that was the gesture to make. Yeah, and tear your garments to make reparation for somebody else's uh, blasphemy. So uh, we see Peter uh, out here, outside, this is the door here, two people standing in the doorway. Here is Peter, we recognize him again. Um, shortly afterwards, Luke says, someone else saw him and said, you're another of them. But Peter replied, I I'm not, my friend. And then in the next uh, uh, image, we can see that the interrogation in front of Caiaphas is continuing, and Peter is still outside the door, and a, a, a woman here sees him, and uh, we're told about an hour later, another person insisted, saying, this fellow was certainly with him. He's a Galilean. My friend, said Peter, I do not know what you're talking about. At that instant, while he was still speaking, the cock crew. There's the cock up there. And the Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. And Peter remembered what the Lord had said to him. Before the cock crows today, you will have disowned me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. Well now, Duchu doesn't show him weeping bitterly or the Lord turning to him. But he uh, does show uh, where the cock uh, uh, comes into the story there, uh, crowing. So let's think again a little bit uh, about Caiaphas. Caiaphas, uh, who, this is a detail of that other uh, slide where he's uh, tearing his garments. Um, thinking about Caiaphas takes us back a couple of days uh, to the incident where uh, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, if you remember that whole thing. 
John gives the details uh, of that incident. Now we must just listen carefully to this. Many of the Jews, John writes, who had come to visit Mary, Mary and Martha, the sisters of Lazarus, and sympathized with her on the death of her brother Lazarus, and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. Many of the Jews came along, saw what Jesus did, and believed in Jesus. But some of them went to tell the Pharisees what Jesus had done. Then the chief priests, including Caiaphas, and the Pharisees called a meeting. Here is this man working all these signs, they said, and what action are we taking? If we let him go on in this way, everyone will believe in him. And the Romans will come and destroy the holy place and our nation. Politics entering into it. One of them, Caiaphas, the high priest that year, said, it is better for one man to die for the people than for the whole nation to be destroyed. But they're going to make Jesus a scapegoat. He'll die. The rest of us will be okay. From that day, continues John, they were determined to kill him. So there was political expediency in the minds uh, and on the part of the, uh, the high priest and those people, Caiaphas. So now, Caiaphas asked Jesus, are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? I am, said Jesus. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. The high priest tore his clothes. What need of witnesses have we now, he said. You heard the blasphemy. What is your finding? And they all gave their verdict that he deserved to die. So, uh, next slide please. As we saw, the high priest tore his robes when he heard what was considered to be what he considered to be a blasphemy. And then afterwards, uh, when he said, when the others said, that, "Oh, he deserves to die," that, that so the cock has crowed and so on, they then began to mock him and jeer him and spit at him, and they blindfolded him. And you can see them raising their hands to hit him, and they got sticks here to to beat him uh, with. So he was maltreated then in the house of Caiaphas. All right. He must have spent the entire night there because Matthew says, when morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people met in council to bring about the death of Jesus. They had him bound and led him away to hand him over to Pilate, the Roman governor. Now, in the next scene, we see Jesus before Pilate. Here is Jesus here. Pilate would normally be standing there or, or seated there. Here are the soldiers guarding him. His hands are still bound. Here is Pilate the Roman governor, and he's distinguished by having a gold uh, wreath of laurel leaves around his head. Laurels, we talk about resting on your laurels and so on. In Roman history, uh, uh, a general who had achieved a great victory would be awarded a laurel wreath, a wreath of laurels. It might be uh, uh, in gold. Uh, it's shown, Duccio shows it there in gold. Now, notice that uh, this is all inside. Jesus is inside, and uh, Pilate is here. And these are all the uh, Jewish people. Notice that they haven't gone inside. Pilate goes out to them. 
They had remained outside the Praetorium so as not to be defiled. Pilate then said to the chief priests and the crowd, I find no case against this man. But they insisted, he's inflaming the people with his teaching all over Judea. It has come all the way down from Galilee, where he started, right down to here. So, it's political, isn't it? He's inflaming the people. And Luke also tells us that they uh, accused him of, of falsely of opposing the payment to the tribute to see the payment of the tribute to Caesar. In other words, these are now civil crimes that they believe they want him to be. You see, they want him to be killed by the Romans, put to death by the Romans. They don't want to do it themselves. They want rid of him, but they're not going to do it. If the Jews actually executed Jesus, they would do so by stoning him. Do you remember St. Stephen, in the first martyr, he was taken out of the city and stoned. That was the, and remember the woman taken in adultery? She, uh, the, the penalty was to be put to death by stoning. That's how the Jews put to death people that they had condemned. But they didn't want to do that. They wanted the Romans to do it. That's why they brought him to Pilate. And Romans crucified criminals. So they wanted him crucified. So Pilate also says to Jesus, then he said the, the, the uh, Jews say uh, that he uh, claimed to be king. Um, and Pilate takes hold of that word. And he says to Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answers, yes. And then uh, they uh, talk about the incitement to violence. And there is another word that, do, that uh, Pilate can take hold of, Galilee. That's interesting. It, his teaching has come all the way down here from Galilee. He started up there. That's where all the trouble started. Now he's starting down here. You have to watch it. He came all the way down from, from there. Galilee, said Pilate, what have I heard? That's great. Galilee, okay, I'll tell you about Galilee. Uh, that's, not my, uh, that's not my area. I'll tell you who looks after Galilee. Herod. So Pilate sends him on to Herod. So, next, in the next slide, uh, yes, that's a detail of the Jews accusing uh, Jesus. And then in the next slide, go on then, please. Oh, that's it, thank you. He's in front of Herod. Now, Herod is a king. So, Ducho shows him on a throne, and notice that he has a crown on his head, and he's dressed uh, differently. This now is the fourth person uh, to have a go at, at, at interrogating uh, Jesus. Jesus here is standing in front of him, but perhaps you can see his eyes. He's not looking at Herod. Uh, in the other scenes, he's looking at his interrogator. He's looking here to one side. And the soldiers and so on are behind him. Let's think about this man, Herod. Who was he? Well, we have all heard of Herod the Great, haven't we? Um, this Herod is a grandson of Herod the Great. Herod the Great was the man who had ten wives and who committed so many crimes that Shakespeare was able to say about a, a crime, it out Herod's Herod. Remember that um, in your school Shakespeare. This Herod is called Herod Antipas. And his position was, his title was, Tetrarch of, Gal of Galilee. A tetrarch, that comes from the, Latin, from the Greek word, like a tetrapach, meaning four. Uh, 
there were four members of the Herod family who divided this whole territory among them, each one ruling a bit of it. And Herod Antipas was the ruler of Galilee, again, uh, on behalf of the Romans. Herod Antipas was the man who divorced his first wife in order to marry Herodias, the wife of his half-brother, King Philip. When John the Baptist told Herod Antipas that this wasn't lawful, Herod had John put in prison and it was to celebrate his birthday that, remember, Salome, the daughter of uh, Herodias, danced and uh, the reward that she asked for was dictated to her by her mother, give me the head of John the Baptist on a platter. They're kind of nice people, aren't they, the Herods? <laughs> So, Herod Antipas, this is Herod Antipas. He has already overseen uh, the execution uh, of John the Baptist in the prison. Herod, we are told, was delighted to see Jesus. He's heard about him. He was delighted to see Jesus and hoped to see some sign, some miracle entertainment, I suppose, really, performed by Jesus. But Luke tells us, although he questioned Jesus at some length, Jesus did not reply to any of his questions. That's how Duccio conveys that. Jesus is not uh, entering into any kind of conversation with Herod, just to, he's ignoring him. He doesn't answer any of his questions. Then, Luke says, Herod, <coughs> together with his guards, treated him with contempt and made fun of him. He put a rich cloak on him. Look at the attendants here, they are bringing along this white cloak. They're going to put the cloak on Jesus and they're going to be roughing him up and making fun of him and jeering him and mocking him. And what will Herod do next? He sent him back to Pilate. So in the next scene, we see Jesus back in front of Pilate wearing this garment. Now Pilate this time is sitting down. So, uh, Pilate called Jesus to him, and the same thing again. Are you the king of the Jews? He asked. And Jesus replied, do you ask this of your own accord, or have others spoken to you about me? Pilate answered, am I a Jew? It is your own people and the chief priests who have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus replied, Mine is not a kingdom of this world. Remember him arriving on the back of a donkey? Mine is not a kingdom of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my men would have fought to prevent my being surrendered to the Jews. But my kingdom is not of this kind. So you are a king then, said Pilate. It is you who say it, answered Jesus. In other words, yes, I am. Yes, I am a king. I was born for this. I came into the world for this, to bear witness to the truth. And all who are on the side of truth, listen to my voice. Truth, said Pilate, what's that? I wonder why Pilate said that. Is it that Pilate really wanted to free Jesus? And he said, for heaven's sake, truth is not going to get you anywhere. It would be pretty revealing, wouldn't it? We're talking nowadays about being in the post-truth era. Something we have to prick up our ears about, isn't it? We have to live by the truth. Jesus 
came among us to bear witness to the truth. Now, having said, what is that? Pilate went out again to the Jews and said, I find no case against him. But, according to a custom of yours, putting it back onto them, I should release one prisoner at the Passover. Would you like me then to release the king of the Jews? At this they shouted, no, not this man, but Barabbas. Pilate then had Jesus taken away and scourged. So, uh, this is the interrogation. Here they are still insisting. And in the next um, image, uh, we see Pilate presiding over the scourging of Jesus. Jesus has been attached to one of the columns there in the Praetorium, the Palace of Pilate. And here are the men with the, with the uh, rods, five or six rods tied together, uh, scourging uh, Jesus. Uh, so, next slide please. The next thing they did, and Pilate watched it again, was they plaited a crown of thorns and they put it on his head and look at them beating his head with the crown of thorns and they put this cloak uh, upon him they dressed him in a purple robe they kept coming up to him and saying hail king of the jews that's the way a king might be dressed and they slapped him in the face So in the next slide, please, Pilate came out again and said to them, look, I'm going to bring him out to you to let you see that I find no case. And Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said, here's the man, look at him, ecce homo, look at him, this is he, harmless. But they shouted, crucify him, crucify him. So then, Matthew tells us, when Pilate saw that he was making no impression upon them, and that in fact a riot was imminent, he took some water, washed his hands in front of the crowd, and said, I am innocent of this man's blood. It is your concern. And the people to a man shouted back, His blood be upon us and on our children. In other words, we will take responsibility for this man's death. So here, and we can see a detail of it in the next slide, is Pilate uh, washing uh, his hands. Look at the attendant who has a jug of water. Here's the water flowing over the hands of Pilate. Another attendant looking up at this gesture uh, and wondering at it. In the end, John tells us, Pilate handed Jesus over to be crucified. So next week, please God, we'll consider the crucifixion. <laughs>